A Christmas Carol Part 1 Marley's Ghost Marley Was Dead to begin with, there is no doubt whatever about that the register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the funeral director, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good for anything he chose to put his hand to, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the comparison, and my hands shall not disturb it or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole administrator, his sole residuary beneficiary, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event. But he was an excellent man of business, and on the very day of the funeral, he took over everything, which was an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started. From, there is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own castle walls than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say St. Paul's churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley, the firm, was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was hard at the grindstone Scrooge. A. Squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous, old, sinner, hard and sharp, from which no steel had ever struck, out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old. Features nipped his pointed nose. Wrinkled his cheek, stiffened his walk, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Frost was on his head, and on his eyebrows, and his thin chin. He carried his own low temperature, always about with him. He froze his office in midsummer, and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill. Him, no wind that blew was bitterer than. He, no falling snow was more intent. Upon its purpose, no rain less open to question foul weather didn't know where to have him the 
heaviest rain and snow and hail could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with glad looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars asked him to bestow a little money, no children. Asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him, coming would tug their owners into doorways or courtyards and then would wag their tails as, though they said, no eye at all is, better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time of all the good, days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy as well, and he could hear the people in the courtyard outside go easing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark. Already it had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices, like red smears upon the brown air. The fog came pouring in at every crack and keyhole, and was so dense outside that although the courtyard was narrow, the houses opposite were mere phantoms, to see the dull cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything one might have thought that nature lived hard by and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's Counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of cupboard was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't add to it for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in, with the shovel the master predicted, that it would be necessary for them to part. Because of this the clerk put on his white woolen scarf and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of a strong imagination, he failed. A. Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save. You, cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge. Humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome. His eyes sparkled and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do said Scrooge. 
Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough, come then. Return the nephew, gaily. What? Right have you to be dismal? What? Reason have you to be sad? Out upon Merry Christmas. What's? Christmas time to you, but a time for. Paying bills without money. A time. For finding yourself a year older, but. Not an hour richer. A time for. Balancing your books and having. Every item in M threw around. Dozen of months presented dead. Against you. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's? Christmas time to you, but a time for. Paying bills without money. A time. For finding yourself a year older, but. Not an hour richer. A time for. Balancing your books and having. Every item in M threw around. Dozen of months presented dead. Against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge. Indignantly, every idiot who goes. About with, Merry Christmas on his. Lips should be boiled with his own. Pudding and buried with a stake of. Holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way. And let me keep it in mine, keep it. Repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you, don't keep it, let me leave it alone. Then, said Scrooge, much good. May it do you? Much good it has ever. Done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas, among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time, when it has come round apart, from the reverence due to its sacred name and origin. If anything belonging to it can be, apart from that as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys and therefore uncle though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket i believe that it has done me good and will do me good and i say god bless it the clerk in the cupboard involuntarily applauded, becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety he poked, the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you. Don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us. Tomorrow, Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why, cried Scrooge's nephew, why, why did you get married? Said Scrooge, because I fell in love, because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, 
as if that were the only one thing in, the world more ridiculous than a. Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. No uncle, but you never came to. See me before that happened. Why? Give it as a reason for not coming. Now? Good afternoon, said. Scrooge. I am sorry with all my heart to find. You so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made the trial in. Homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge, and a Happy New Year. Good. Afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without Anne. Angry word notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them pleasantly. There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam, this madman in letting Scrooge's nephew out had let two other people in. They were well-fed gentlemen pleasant to behold, and now stood, with their hats off, in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands, and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list, have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago, this very night. It certainly was, for they had been similar in character. At the ominous word generosity, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back at this festive Season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen. It is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? asked Scrooge. Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen. Again, and the union houses for the poor, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman, I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I'm very glad to hear it under the Impression that they scarcely furnish. Christian cheer of mind, or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are, endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. 
What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die if they would. Rather die, said Scrooge, they had. Better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that, but you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentlemen withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself, and in a better temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring torches, offering their services to go before horses in carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church whose old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with vibrations. Afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up, there the cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some libraries were repairing the gas pipes and had lit a great fire round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes, before the blaze in delight, the water trough being left in. Solitude, the overflowing water set, and turned to slippery ice. The brightness of the shops where holly and berries crackled in the lamp, Heat of the windows made pale, faces red as they passed. Poultry sellers and grocers' shops became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant with which it was next to. Impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of the mighty Mansion House gave orders to his fifty cooks and servants to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and violent in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's, putting in his attic the owner of one scant young nose, chewed and mumbled by the hungry, cold as bones are chewed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to sing him a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more frost. At length the hour of shutting up the counting-house arrived. With an ill will Scrooge got down from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the 
cupboard, who instantly put his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir, it's not. Convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every twenty-fifth of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat to the chin, but I suppose you must have the whole day be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white scarf dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down an ice slide at the end of a line of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could run to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and, having read all the newspapers, spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, then went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a low building up a yard, where it had so little business to be, that one could scarcely help fancying. It must have run there when it was a young house playing at hide-and-seek with other houses, and forgotten the way out again. It was old enough now and sad enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was compelled to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the weather sat in sad meditation on the threshold. Now it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence. In that place, also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy, and then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock, of the door saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. It was not hidden in shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air. And though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That and its ugly color made it horrible. 
but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather, than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker. Again, to say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from, infancy would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in and lit his candle. He did pause with a moment's hesitation before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified. With the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall, but there was nothing on the back of the door except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on, so he said, Pooh, pooh, and closed it with a bang. The sound rang through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchants, cellars below, appeared to have a separate echo of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly too trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs. But I mean to say, you might have got a funeral. Carriage up that staircase, taken it. Sideways, with the splinter bar towards the wall, and the door towards the stair rails. And done it easy. There was plenty of width for that, and room to spare. Which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive funeral carriage going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's candle. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of thin soup. Scrooge had a cold in his head upon the stove. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual. Old. Fire guard. Old shoes. Two. Fish baskets. Washing stand on three. Legs and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in. Lumber room as usual. Old. Fire guard. Old shoes. Two. Fish baskets. Washing stand on three. Legs and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his tie, 
put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat down before the fire to take his soup. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one built by some Dutch merchant long ago and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain and Abel, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic, messengers descending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's apostles putting off to sea in boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. And yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blank at first, with power to shape some picture on its surface from the broken fragments of his thoughts there, would have been a copy of old. Marley's head on every one. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in, the chair his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose. Now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building, it was with great astonishment and with a strange inexplicable dread that as he looked he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted half a minute, or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun. Together, they were succeeded by a noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it, his color changed, though when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up, as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, the same face, the very same, Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, the chain he drew, was clasped about his middle, it was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made of cash boxes, keys, locks, ledgers, deeds and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor 
Did he believe it even now? Though he looked the phantom, through and through, and saw it, standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes, and marked the very texture of the folded scarf bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before he was still unbelieving and fought against his senses. How now? said Scrooge, mocking and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much, Marley's voice, no doubt. About it. Who are you? Ask me. Who I was, who were you then? Said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular, for a shade, he was going to say to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life I was your partner, Jacob Marley, can you? Can you sit down? asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can do it then, Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of its being impossible it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have of my Reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. There's more of gravy than of grave. About you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means humorous. Then the truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention, for the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones to sit staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would be scrooge felt very uncomfortable with him there was something very awful too in the spectre's being provided with hellish atmosphere of its own scrooge could not feel it himself but this was clearly the case for though the ghost sat perfectly motionless. Its hair and skirts were still agitated, as by the hot vapour from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge, for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. I do, replied the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of small ugly creatures, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a faint. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking 
off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face mercy he said dreadful vision why do you trouble me man of the worldly mind replied the ghost do you believe in me or not i do said scrooge i must but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me it is required of every man the ghost returned that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide and if that spirit goes not forth in life it condemned so after death it is doomed to wander through the world oh woe is me and witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness again the specter raised a cry and shook its chain and rung its shadowy hands you are in chains said scrooge trembling tell me why i wear the chain forged in life replied the ghost i made it link by link and yard by yard i put it on of my own free will and of my own free will i wear it is its pattern strange to you scrooge trembled more and more or would you know pursued the ghost the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself it was full as heavy and as long as this seven christmas eves ago you have labored on it since dot it is a hefty chain scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty fathoms but he could see nothing jacob he said old jacob marley tell me more speak comfort to me jacob i have none to give the ghost replied it comes from other regions ebenezer scrooge and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men nor can i tell you what i would a very little more is all permitted to me i cannot rest i cannot stay i cannot linger anywhere my spirit never walked beyond our counting house mark me in life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money changing hole and weary journeys lie before me whenever he became thoughtful too put his hands in his trouser pockets pondering on what the ghost had said he did so now without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees you must have been very slow about it jacob scrooge observed in business-like way though with humility slow the ghost repeated seven years dead mused scrooge and traveling all the time the whole time said the ghost no rest no peace unending torture of remorse you travel fast said scrooge on the wings of the wind replied the ghost you might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years said scrooge the ghost on hearing this 
set up another cry, and rattled, its chain hideously in the dead. Silence of the night. Oh, captive, bound and double-ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I, but you were always a good man of business. Jacob faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, ringing its hands again. My time is nearly gone, I will, said Scrooge. But don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray, how it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you. Many and many a day, it was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the sweat from his brow. That is no light part of my self-punishment, pursued the ghost. I am here, tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping. My fate, chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer, you were always a good friend to me. Thank you will be haunted. Resume the ghost by three. Spirits, Scrooge's face fell almost as low as the ghosts had done, is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge, without their visits. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one, couldn't I take em all? At once, and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second. On the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when. The last stroke of twelve has ceased. To vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look. That, for your own sake, you. Remember what has passed. Between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound over and about its arm. The ghost walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself little, so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did, when they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up, its hand warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became aware of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailing sorrowful, and self-accusation. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the sad sound, and floated out upon the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering about in 
restless haste, and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few they might be guilty governments were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle who cried helplessly at being unable to assist a wretched woman with infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power whether these creatures faded into mist or mist surrounded them he could not tell but they and their spirit voices faded together and the night became as it had been when he walked home scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes. When the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters, so he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment, the heavy bell went on, from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve. It was past. Two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong. A piece of ice must have got into the works. Twelve. He touched the spring of his timepiece to correct this most outrageous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve and stopped. Why, it is impossible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day. It is impossible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold and that there was no noise of people running to and fro, and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day, and taken possession of the world. Scrooge went to bed again, and thought and thought, and thought it, over and over and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavored not to think, more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself after mature inquiry that it was all a dream, his mind flew back. Again, like a strong spring released to its first position and presented the same problem to be worked all 
through. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay, in this state until the chime had, gone three quarters more when he, remembered, on a sudden, that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell rang one. He, resolved to lie awake until the hour, was past, and considering that he could know, more go to sleep than go to heaven. This was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously and missed the clock. At length it broke upon his listening. Ear, ding, dong. A quarter passed, said Scrooge, counting. Ding, dong. Half past, said Scrooge. Ding, dong. A quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding, dong. The hour itself, said Scrooge, triumphantly, and nothing. Else, he spoke before the hour bell. Sounded which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those two which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-sitting attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man viewed through some supernatural medium which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it and the most tender Bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular. The hands the same as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet most delicately formed were like those upper members bare. It wore a gown of the purest white and round its waist was bound a shiny belt which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light by which all this was visible and which was doubtless the occasion of its using in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it now held under its arm. Even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality, for as its belt sparkled and glittered now in one part and now in Another, and what was light one, instant, at another time was dark so. The figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm now, with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which, dissolving parts, no outline would be visible in the dense gloom where they melted away. 
and in the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was I was told? About? asked Scrooge. I am. The voice was soft and gentle, singularly low as if instead of being so close. Beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past, long past, inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. Know your past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody could, have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap, and begged him to be covered. What, exclaimed the ghost, would you so soon put out? With worldly hands, the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap? Scrooge reverently denied all intention to offend or any knowledge of having intentionally capped the spirit at any period of his life. He then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged. The spirit must have heard him, thinking, for it said immediately, Your reclamation, then. Take heed. It put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise, and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm and the temperature along, way below freezing, that he was clad, but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted, he rose, but finding that, the spirit made towards the window, clasped his robe. I am a mortal. Scrooge pleaded, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his. Hark, and you shall be upheld in. More than this, as the words were spoken, they passed through the wall, and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either side. The city had entirely vanished. Not a trace of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter, they with snow upon the ground. Good heaven! said Scrooge, clasping his hands together as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy. Here the spirit gazed upon him, mildly, its gentle touch though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odors, floating, each one connected with a thousand though, and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost, and what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered with an unusual catch in his voice that it was a spot and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. 
you recollect the way? Inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge, with enthusiasm. I could walk it, with my eyes covered, strange too. Have forgotten it for so many years. Observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge, recognizing every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance with its bridge and winding river. Some ponies were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country, gigs and farmers. All these boys were in great spirits, and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music that the crisp air laughed too. Hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us. The laughing travelers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at cross roads and by ways for their several homes. What was Merry Christmas to? Scrooge. Out upon Merry Christmas. What good had it ever? Then to him, the school is not. Quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his. Friends is left there still, Scrooge. Said he knew it and he sobbed. They left the high road by a well, remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red, brick with a little weathercock on a tower which had a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. For the spacious offices were little used, their walls were damp and mossy there, windows broken and their gates decayed, hens clucked and strutted in the stables and the coach houses, and sheds were overrun with grass, nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the gloomy hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms they found them poorly furnished, cold, and vast. There was an earthy smell in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by, candlelight, and not much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall, a door at the back of the house. It opened before them, and a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of plain, wooden formed desk. At one of these a lonely boy was, reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be, not a latent echo, in the house, not a squeak from the mice behind the paneling, not a drip from the half-thawed water, tap in the dull yard behind, not a sigh, among the leafless branches of tree, not the idle swinging of an empty storehouse door, no, not a clicking in, the fire, but fell upon the heart of Scrooge with a softening influence, and gave a freer passage 
The spirit touched him on the arm and pointed to his younger self. Intent upon his reading, suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window with an axe stuck in his belt and leading by the bridle an ass laden with wood. Why, it's Ali Baba. Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy, It's dear old, honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know. One Christmas time when this solitary child was left here all alone, he did come for the first time just like that. Poor boy, and Valentine, said Scrooge and his wild brother, Orson, to hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such stories in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying, and to see his heightened and excited face would have been a Surprise to his business friends in the city indeed. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge. Green body and yellow tail with a thing like a lettuce growing out of the top of his head. There he is. Poor Robin Crusoe, he called him when he came home again after sailing. Round the island, poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday running for his life to the little creek. Halloa, hoop, halloo. Then, with a rapidity of transition, very foreign to his usual character. He said, in pity for his former self, Poor boy! And cried again. I wish! Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him, after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? Asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked supports were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a sad shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened and a little girl much younger than the boy came darting in and putting her arms about his neck and often kissing him addressed him as her dear dear brother i have come to bring you home dear brother said the child clapping her tiny hands and bending down to laugh too Bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan? Returned the boy. Yes, said the child. 
brimful of glee. Home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should. And sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes and are never to come back here. But first we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him in her childish eagerness towards the door, and he, not loath to go, accompanied her a terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box. There and in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious look and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands. He then conveyed him and his sister into the old well of a shivering best parlor that ever was seen where the maps upon the wall and the globes in the windows were waxy with cold. Here he produced a container of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered those treats to the young people at the same time sending out a meager servant to offer a glass of something to the coachman who answered that he thanked the gentleman. Here he produced a container of curiously light wine and a block of curiously heavy cake and administered those treats to the young people at the same time, sending out a meager servant to Offer a glass of something to the coachman, who answered that he thanked the gentleman, but if it was the same tap as he had tasted before, he had rather not. Master Scrooge's trunk, being by this time tied on to the top of the chaise, the children said, Goodbye to the schoolmaster, right? Willingly and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the frost, and snow from off the dark leaves, of the evergreens like spray, always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart, so she had, cried Scrooge, you're right. I will not deny it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children, one child, Scrooge, returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew, Scrooge, seemed uneasy in his mind, and answered, Briefly, yes, although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy streets of a city where shadowy passengers passed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way and all. The noise and chaos of a real city was, it was made plain enough, 
by the dressing of the shops that, here too, it was Christmas time, again. But it was evening, and the streets were lit up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. I was apprenticed here. They went in. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his large waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, joyful voice. Yo-ho, there, Ebenezer, Dick, Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice, Dick Wilkins to be. Sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No, more work tonight. Christmas Eve. Dick. Christmas. Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old. Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack. Robinson. You wouldn't believe how. Those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters one, two, three had em. Up in their places four, five, six. Barred em and pinned em seven, eight, nine, and came back before. You could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick. Chirrup. Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have. Cleared away with old Fezziwig. Looking on. It was done in a minute. Everything movable was packed off, as if it were dismissed from public. Life forever the floor was swept, and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug, and warm and dry, and bright ballroom, as you would desire to see upon a Winter's night, in came a fiddler with a music book, and went up to the lofty desk, and made an orchestra of it, and tuned, like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers, whose hearts they broke. In came all, the young men and women, employed in the business. In came, the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her, brother's particular friend, the milkman, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one who was, proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress, and they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, and they all came anyhow, and every how, away they all went, Twenty couple at once. 
hands half round and back, again the other way, down the middle, and up again, round and round in, various stages of affectionate, grouping, old top couple always, turning up in the wrong place new, top couple starting off again as, soon as they got there, all top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about old, Fezziwig clapping his hands to stop, the dance cried out, well done, and the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially, provided for that purpose, but scorning rest upon his reappearance he instantly began again though there were no dancers yet as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shudder and he were a brand new man resolved to beat him out of sight or perish there were more dances and there were forfeits and more dances and there was cake, and there was spiced wine, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the feast when the fiddler a clever dog mined the sort of man who knew his business better than you, or I could have told it. Him struck up Sir Roger D. Coverley, then old Fezziwig stood, out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them three, or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be interfered, with people who would dance and had no notion of walking, but if they had been twice as many for times, old Fezziwig would have been matching them. So would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher, and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire both hands to your partner bow curtsy corkscrew thread the needle and back again to your place fezziwig cut cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger when the clock struck eleven this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a merry Christmas, when everybody had retired but the two apprentices they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man, out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self. He remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent 
the strangest agitation. It was not until now when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon its head burned very clear. A small matter, said the ghost. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and when he had done so, said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this? Praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heeded by the remark and speaking, unconsciously like his former, not. His latter, self.it isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy, or unhappy to make our service light, or heavy, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count him up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune, he felt. The spirits glance and stopped. What is the matter? Ask the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think? The ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge. No, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all his former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish. For again, Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and greed. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye which showed the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in the morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas. Past, it matters little, she said, softly, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can, cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered. Gently, I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain absorbs you. Have I not? What then? He retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you, she shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man, 
I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am that which promised happiness when we were one in. Heart is weighed down with misery. Now that we are two, how often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say it is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words. No, never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness. Tell me, would you seek me out, and try to win me now? Oh, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this possibility in spite of himself. But he said with a struggle, you think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a girl without money from her family? You who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him. You once were, he was about to, speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may the memory of what is past half makes. Me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly, as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more cried Scrooge. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost held him with both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place. A room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now an attractive woman, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly chaotic, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. The Consequences were noisy beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter soon beginning to mingle in. The sports got attacked by the young boys most ruthlessly. What? 
would I not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude. No, no, I wouldn't for the wealth of all. The world have crushed that braided hair and torn it down, and for the precious little shoe I wouldn't have plucked it off, God bless my soul, to save my life, as to measuring her, waist and sport as they did, bold, young brood, I couldn't have done it, I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for a punishment and never come straight again, and yet I should have dearly liked I own to have touched her lips to have questioned her that she might have opened them to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eye and never raised to have let loose waves of hair and inch of which would be a souvenir beyond price in short i should have liked i do confess to have had the lightest license of a child and yet too have been man enough to know its value but now a knocking at the door was heard and such a rush immediately ensued that she with laughing face was borne towards it the centre of a flushed and excited group just in time to greet the father who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents, then the shouting and the struggling, and the attack that was made on the defenseless porter, the scaling him, with chairs for ladders to dive into, his pockets take from him of brown paper parcels hold on tight by, his tie hug him round neck thump, his back and kick his legs in wild affection, the shouts of wonder and delight with which the contents of every package was received, the terrible announcement the baby had taken in the act of putting doll's frying pan into his mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a make-believe turkey glued on a wooden plate the immense relief of finding this a false alarm the joy gratitude and ecstasy they are all indescribable alike dot it is enough that degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlor and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house, where they went to, bed, and so subsided. And now, Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such, another creature quite as graceful, and as full of promise might have, called him father and been a springtime in the winter of his life. His sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Tut, don't I know? She added in the same breath, laughing. As he laughed, Mr. Scrooge, Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office, window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death. I hear and there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place 
I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. Scrooge exclaimed, I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face, in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me. No longer. In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle in which the ghost with no visible resistance on its own part was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge, observed that its light was burning, high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon the ghost's head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down, with all his force he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible sleepiness and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in, which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep.